All right. Well, let's see if this thing works. It seems like it is. Welcome. So glad that you guys are here. Um, I get to host today because I'm not preaching today. And you may have noticed I'm wearing something a little bit different. I've got my Ninja Turtle shirt on today. Um, and not only do I have my Ninja Turtle shirt on, I have to show you this. Let's see. It, it won't come across on camera. I'm so sorry. Um, but I have on my MTV socks, right? MTV socks. And you may say, well, why, Pastor Charles? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, you may say, Pastor Charles, why in the world are you wearing all this crazy stuff? Well, today, over in Kids, not right at this very moment right now, but uh, during the 1030 service, they are having an 80s party. Um, now, I was born in the 80s, so I thought I should, like, rep just a little bit on all that sort of stuff. Um, and so they're having a good time over there and going to be a lot of fun. Uh, and so they're looking forward to it. And so um, be praying for them uh, as they um, celebrate today. And it's also a celebration because this is their promotion day. So those that are going to be going into kindergarten this fall, um, they'll be promoting into kids. Those that are going into students, I have one of these. She's a, she was a fifth grader. She'll now be a sixth grader. Um, she'll be in student ministry. They promote on up. Yeah, look, the students over there are all excited. Whoop, whoop. Yeah, and so um, good stuff going on there. Um, oh, I forgot to change up the graphics, so put up the bad graphic anyways. Speaking of students, in two weeks, right, they have, um, oh, actually, next week, next week, they have a pool party um, back over at Miss LeRae's house, um, and if you need an address for that, just see her or see Miss Stephanie uh, or, or any of the ladies at the back, and they'll help you figure out how to get there to her place. Um, pool party, lots and lots of fun. Um, last time, I think we had like a badminton championship going on. Um, I lost. It was terrible. Um, so I got to go back and, and avenge myself on all of that. And the third thing that's coming up is camp is coming up, um, and we've been talking about camp for a couple of weeks. Camp is coming up July the 18th through the 21st. Um, I think there's maybe just a couple of spots left for camp. There's not a whole lot of spots left, um, so get, get signed up for that. Um, not only that, but some of you have been asking about, well, when's the day that we're doing the Give Towards Camp Day? Um, and that's July the 4th. Um, that's our Camp Sunday that we'll be talking about and, and uh, featuring what a camp uh, sponsorships look like. How are we doing all of that? Um, so that day is still coming. Well, hey, if you haven't already grabbed your phone, text TCE Live to 97000, you should get in the habit of that because starting next week, those of you who text in are going to have a chance to win something special that you're not going to want to miss out on, um, but we're only going to be choosing from people who text TCE Live. So make sure that you do that, that you text in, um, that you're here. The number is 97,000, and the word is TCE Live, L I V E. Um, make sure that you do that. Even if you're watching online, you can win too. Um, so make sure that you're um, doing those things. Well, with that, I'm going to invite you guys to stand with me as we engage in some God honoring worship. King of 
Thank you for standing up to all the things in our lives that we can't stand up to all by ourselves. No matter how hard we try, we just need to remember that we need to look to you, God. We need to look to you in every moment of every day. I feel like at times we run into it where we have a plan and we have a path that we think our lives should take. And we get really close to some friends and we give them everything we have and then for whatever reason they leave. Maybe we were working really hard towards a promotion at our job and instead of you getting it, somebody else does. And you sit there and you dwell on, why didn't I get it? What happened? In those moments, those are the moments that we seek for validation. We wanna feel valued in what we're doing. And we want God Oh, we want to remember that God is who gives us that validation. You can't search for it from other people because you're not going to get it. And I think sometimes we chase it from others and we get so discouraged because at the end of the day you feel like, am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing right now? Is this what God really intended for me to do? Because I just feel like in this moment, I'm not enough. I just want to take a moment to say today that we need to run to the Father. We need to allow Him to give us the validation that we are so, so seeking for in life. Because He's the one at the end of the day and in the beginning of the day and all throughout the day that's going to give you exactly what you're needing in that moment. But you have to run to him. And you have to lay your life down to say, look, God, this isn't where I want to be. I don't know what you wanted from me. But in this moment, I'm giving it to you and I'm saying, thank you. Thank you for validating me. Thank you for making me know that I am exactly who you wanted me to be in this moment and that my time might not have come. A lot of things change in life. And sometimes it's so, so hard to just say, okay, let go, let God. It's easier said than done, I feel like. But as we do this next song, I just want you to think of whatever that one thing is in your life that you feel like you're just not measuring up. And in that moment, you give it to God and you run to him and say, God, you are the thing that I've been searching for. You are what I need. And I'm dropping everything else and I'm running to you because you are going to give me the validation I need because I love you. And you love me for everything that I am and that I am exactly who you created me to be. Just sit on that for a minute and sing with me, Run to the Father.
your son for redemption the price for my heart and I don't have a bondage with that kind of love I don't understand I can't comprehend all I know is I need you I run to the Father fall into grace My soul needs a friend, so I'll run to the Father again and again. I'll run to the Father, fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend, so I'll run to the Father again and again.
Powerful, powerful prayer for our neighbors, right? God, we do pray all of that stuff. Hey, um, as part of worship, one of the opportunities that we have is uh, an opportunity to give. And over the last several weeks, have we been, uh, as we finished up this whole series on what is love, one of the ways that we talked about that is loving is giving, and those who love through giving of gifts. You know, we are supposed to stretch ourselves, even if that's not our natural love language, to still say, God, I love you. You've poured all of this stuff out on me, and I have an opportunity to pour back to you and to express and to stretch and to grow what my love looks like. So we're going to take a moment right now um, just to um, give, a chance to give back. Now, um, we're not going to pass a plate. Um, actually, what we've got is at the back of the room, um, we have a... Um, a, a box that you can just put an offering into, um, or there's some other things that you can do. Um, you can text. You can text the number 84321, and if you text any dollar amount to that, so if you just type in um, $20 into that and send it to that number, um, if you've never done it before, it'll walk you through the process. It'll give you some prompts and say, hey, how do we um, do all of this? And so you can give through texting. You can go on our Church Center app. Um, it's a great way to do that. If you're not on Church Center with us, let me just encourage you, download Church Center. It's on both Android and on um, Apple or iOS devices. Um, and so put that on there. We have all, almost everything that goes on inside of the church is on there. So if you're looking to get involved in a group, you can do that through there. If you're looking for what's going on with some of these events that we've talked about, those are on there. If you want to give, you can give through that as well. Um, and even the messages, most of them are on there. Not all the time, not 100%, but most of them uh, are on there. In fact, most of the time you can even um, come back and watch something on there um, streaming. So it's really an, an incredible tool. And so if you haven't downloaded that, make sure you do that. Um, you can also just go onto our website, www.australia.church. Um, this is how my family gives. Um, we set this up long ago that um, when our paychecks come in, it just takes 10% straight out, and it goes out twice a month. Um, and we just have that set. And so maybe you're a set it and forget it sort of a person. You're like, you know what? I'm terrible about bringing something with me. I'm terrible about doing this. But it's a great way to be able to um, engage in that so that you can grow that gift of stewardship in your life. Um, so, hey, we're just going to take a moment right now to, to pray for this, this offering, and then I'm going to introduce you to a great friend of mine. Father, thank you so much for um, this opportunity to express our love to you and God to express our love to our neighbors because without the, the resources, the things that you're bringing here in, into this place that you're um, collecting together, the work that we're doing, the cooperation, God, we wouldn't be able to accomplish the mission that you've left us to do. So God, I thank you for that. I thank you that we can hear stories from um, ladies that are having their lives transformed by um, Bible studies that they're in and that then they're engaging in discipleship on the backside all because of you bringing your church here into this community. And so God, I, I challenge right now and just that we would see the way that the resources that we're giving, that the gifts that we're giving, the way that it would impact lives in the days to come. God, we just give you all of the glory and the honor in your name. Amen. Well, I told you earlier that I get to wear this shirt today because I'm not preaching, so you don't have to stare at it for 35 minutes. You just have to stare at it for three and a half to five minutes. Um, so, but uh, I invited a great friend of mine to come and to share with us today. His name is Dave Arden. Um, Dave and I have been friends for almost five years. Um, I met Dave whenever I was in the process of coming out to start this church. In fact, um, Dave and I's story goes all the way back to, um, if you've ever heard our story about how we up in Australia um, getting lost at MC 85 in Australia Parkway. Um, Dave took my family, my wife and I, out to Verado. We saw Verado, and he said, all right, I'm going to take you over to Tolleson. Um, and I don't, I know I'm not saying that name right. It's kind of like Australia. Nobody says Tolleson right either. Um, and so he was headed there, and we got lost. And he was like, I don't really know where we're at. Because what I didn't know at the time is he'd only been in Phoenix for two weeks at that point in time. Um, and so we were sitting there at the corner of Australia Parkway and MC 85, and I looked over at the 
were beautiful mountains that were the Australia Mountains, and there were new home builder signs that pointed up there. Um, and I was like, let's just go that away. Forget wherever it was that you were taking us. Let's just go up into those mountains. And so, um, so we did, and we came and found Australia and fell in love. And Dave um, kind of helped us and guided us along the way as we were starting this church. And so he and I have a, a long relationship going back. Um, he actually is working with a new organization now that uh, is called SOM. Uh, and Dave, remind me, I know it's something of martyrs. What does the S stand for? spirit of martyrdom. Um, and so he's going to come and he's going to talk a little bit about what that looks like, but it is, fits in so well with where we've been at with talking about what is love and how we express love and what is the natural outcome of all of that, that I couldn't think of something better to drop in and to do. So give him your best attention. We've got a video to start this all off with, and then he's going to come and share with you. Thank you guys. of heaven, the angels and the saints, all who've gone before us, surround us here today, let's throw off every burden and lift up our gaze, get caught in this story and lost in his face. Sure, my story. I can run this race because Jesus ran it before me, and He is on my side. I have everything that I need, and if you listen close, you'll hear heaven cheering for me. Persecuted and restricted regions, people are responding to the gospel like never before. I can run this race because Jesus ran it before me. In a 90% Muslim nation, government officials visit Muslim Background of Believers Ministry Center to thank the staff for their leadership with distributing thousands of masks and tons of food. Never in history has this happened. We are in unprecedented revival, reports SOM International Contact. Tens of thousands of Bibles have been distributed. Venezuelans are praying for two million Bibles to share. for remembering us, said tribal Mexicans in the remote mountains after receiving many practical supplies. We're the sons, the daughters. Over 150,000 masks produced and distributed. Over 2,000 house churches planted in unreached villages. No fear can shake us. No Over believers baptized and 18 house churches established. All this happened in the first four months of COVID-19.
Lord Jesus, how, what a wonderful um, Savior and Master you are. Father, what a wonderful God you are. You have a vision for every tribe and every nation. Lord, your desire, your heart is that none, not one would perish. Um, Lord, your heart is big, your heart is huge, and you're reaching out your heart around the world and uh, have chosen us to be salt and be light. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this wonderful church. Thank you for your perseverance by your spirit and the perseverance of the saints here to keep standing and to endure um, the last few years especially. Bless our time today. Speak through us your word. God, give us encouragement, God. Encourage us from your word, encouragement from your spirit. God, just pour out your passion, your love, and your grace uh, into our lives today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you, Charles and uh, Estrella family for this opportunity to come and speak today about the global church, and especially to talk today about India uh, and experience. I'm, I'm so thankful. I've been, as Charles said, uh, connected to the church for, for years, uh, prayed for the church for a long time, and just feel a, a part of the extended family of the church and just a part of you here over the years as you've uh, served so faithfully. Um, uh, my heart is that of a planter. You're going to hear me talk about the organization, what the organization does, and that's, that's fine, good, and you need to hear that. But I, I want you to know my heart is that of a planter. I've been in th- the shoes of Charles and uh, have experiences like him where you, uh, you're kind of, they say the road uh, to success is uh, uphill. Well, I'm planting in Arizona, it's a cliff. Uh, and in, in, in the COVID, it's even a steeper cliff. So God bless you all for your faithfulness uh, to, uh, to stand fast all these, uh, all these months and, and years here. Our orga- organization is called Spirit of Martyrdom based here in Arizona, simply it's about courage, the courage to be a bold witness. Uh, We're empowering a bold and courageous witness in remote areas where the gospel is inaccessible and where Jesus is unknown. Reaching out to tribal groups, rural villages, and persecuted believers in places like India, Bangladesh, Colombia, Venezuela, Senegal, Mexico and many more countries. It takes courage to plant a church. Let's just call it what it is. It takes courage and takes a lot of faith and endurance to plant a church. Uh, you know that firsthand. I was with Charles that first time uh, they came into this community, and uh, my story has a little different version of it. Charles is right that we didn't know really what God had in store that day. I do remember, Charles, we prayed to start the day. We, we were smart enough to know, Holy Spirit, you know. We know we were looking at the West Valley. We know God was, uh, you know, leaning them in here, but we didn't know where. So we, we did pray. All right, Lord, you show us where to go. And so we're, we are driving around. It had been just a very short time since I've been in Phoenix and hadn't really heard much about this community. My side of the story is that it wasn't Charles, per se, that said this go this, this way. And we were a little bit uh, confused, maybe not lost, but confused as where to go. But I, in my memory, it was Steph uh, that kind of rescued us here because Steph saw we were looking for homes for sale and uh, open houses. And Steph... Uh, say, let's go down this road. And so we, um, you follow the Holy Spirit and you follow your wife. And when they're working the same direction, you, right, you know where to go, right? So we went on that day, down the road. And, uh, but I, what I do remember about Charles, which was so encouraging to me and so, such, so bless, such a blessing to me, is we went in for, to look at homes and homes for sale, open houses. You know, Charles went in, we went into one place and Charles just made himself immediately comfortable. Literally, he just threw himself and jumped into this chair. Or, or maybe it was a recliner, whatever, or some kind of a... Uh, a sleeping device, but whatever it was, it was just, it blessed me, because Charles is like, I'm just, I'm just diving in, I'm throwing myself in there, and what a, uh, what a memory that was, uh, really a metaphor to me, Charles, of your willingness to throw yourself into church planning, to missions, to the community. Charles is like um, modern-day Mandalorian, you know, seely faith, and uh, just courage in the Lord, um, and good with kids, little Otis, and uh, he's raising up here, and also that little burner, I love that little fire flamethrower that he does, you know, he turns obstacles into s'mores, that's what Charles does, he does <laughs> like this, and that's Charles, and I'm really uh, so blessed and thankful to call him friend, and, and I'm thankful for the bold witness of the church um, to be so faithful all these many years. Today, I want to ask a question. Why go to the remote places uh, around the world to share the gospel? I mean, we have a lot of family here, friends here that need the Lord, a lot of neighbors here, certainly, and we want to reach those as well, but why, why go to remote, faraway places, and why specifically India uh, to share the Lord and share the gospel? Um, uh, I want to just spark your imagination today. I want to just really whet your appetite to just the understanding of this global church and this global family that we get to be a part of, just to help you understand a little more and desire to know more about it. Uh, the Lord has chosen India as a, really a church planting dreamland, if you will, uh, where a spiritual awakening is happening. People are coming to Christ by the, the, the droves and where uh, uh, church planters are being raised up in abundance. Um, praise God, India is one of these places you can get to India going going east, you can get to India going west. Uh, Eventually, you're going to end up there. That's how far away it is. But man, what an amazing, beautiful, powerful, 
uh, uh, incredible country um, that's there. They're going to start showing a little few slides of our experience there and what that's about. When you, uh, when you arrive in India, you're, you're just struck by the thousands of years of, of history there and a uh, land with shr- many shrines and sanctuaries, palaces, a, line, uh, a land of monuments and forests, just galore. So it's rich in history, steeped in history. We usually land in Delhi and get our feet wet by basking in a, in a school that was about six or 700 years old there where you can kind of see some of the uh, really uh, ornate architecture. Of course, India, the overwhelming vibe is, is Hinduism. Oh, yeah, there's uh, 180 million Muslims there, but you got a billion plus Hindus there. So you got shrines, and the big focus there is on millions of gods and goddesses, um, small g, right, small g. And the people of any of though are beautiful, um, restless, but so diverse. Hundreds of languages spoken, 2,445 unreached people groups in India. Our mission is to take people from the small g to the, to the big G, right? That's it. In a nutshell, we're taking people that there's not... Can you imagine, Charles, you, you grow up your whole life as there's millions of gods and there's millions of goddesses, right? You know, but they're unknowable. You can't get... And then one day, Jesus shows up in your life and you get to know him. You go from millions of gods to one God, but you realize this one God is enough. Other religions kind of make fun of Christians because you've only got one God, but they don't know Jesus, do they? They don't know his love, his grace, his power. And these Indians that are outcast and thrown aside all of a sudden find significance and joy, meaning and purpose in life. It's incredible. Um, There are 620,000 villages in India. Six, let me repeat that again, 620,000 villages. Villages. That's a lot of people, right? They average about 1,100 people per village. 65% of India is rural. Uh, most people live in what would be a 12 by 12 house with a thatched roof, dirt floor. Uh, you make about a buck, a buck and a half a day as a day laborer uh, in India. Largely, they are outcasts in society. We work with the, the Dallas, the outcasts. Uh, many cannot read. Um, society places walls up everywhere. So if you're one of the lower caste, um, you are stuck in the low caste. There's really no hope for you to, to come out of that lower class. Um, but when you meet Christ, your whole world changes. The best way I can describe it in India is this. It's about a third the size of the U.S. So take um, our east coast from the Mississippi over to the Atlantic, um, kind of north and south. It's about that size of a country. Think about how crowded that part of India, or that part of uh, the, the East Coast is. We've got 150 million people. Think about the traffic on the East Coast. Now let's take the 180 million people, the rest of America, and shove them into that same part of the East Coast. Think about how much more crowded that would be. Wow, that's a lot of traffic. Now multiply times four, right? There's a lot of people there. There's a lot of opportunity there. There's a lot going on, right? Personal space when you're in a crowded city is not, uh, is not very... Uh, uh, not very frequent, but it's an amazing opportunity. The population is looking to surpass China at 1.39 billion people now, almost 1.4 billion people, over a, uh, half of which are under 25. So think about a country where there's literally 500 million people that are under the age of 25, young, growing, learning, want to know what their life is about, want to know what the future is, want to have hope. Why engage India? Simply put, it's one of the best opportunities on the planet uh, to share the gospel, uh, to share Christ. And there's a hunger there, a deep hunger to, to, to know more and to want more. And praise God, it's not like 100 years ago where you have to take a boat. Our first trip to India, I thought about, wow, you know, 100 years ago, I'd be getting on a boat and it might be a month trip and maybe a month coming back and maybe I don't even come back, right? Maybe I don't come back. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you're familiar with that verse. Jesus says, um, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and as far as the remotest part of the earth. Jesus is sending us. He's calling us to to care, to pray, uh, to go if necessary, but to engage a world that just is beginning to experience the depths of Christ's love. Um, but how can, we, 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 uh, how can we care if we're not really aware of what's going on in that part of the world? Such a, such a great verse, uh, Acts 1.8. I get 
excited I get talking fast, or else you're going to be kind of my volume and control over there. I have a little speaking issue sometimes, and I think my grandfather dropped me on my head when I was about one and shook something loose. So, Charles, you're going to be my volume and control over there, brother. Just kind of give me one of these. But uh, Acts 1 8 says, There's power that comes upon you. When you're living on mission for God, there's a power. It's not you, it's Christ in you more and more, right? Just working together with the Lord, power from the Holy Spirit abounding in you, filled with peace and love and strength in the Lord. You should be my witnesses, Jesus says, in Jerusalem, which is our, it's our uh, Metro Phoenix, our Goodyear area here, right? It's uh, Judea, which is our Maricopa County. Samaria is like our state, right? Uh, Sedona is part of Samaria in uh, more ways than one, right? But uttermost parts is those remote areas out of the country, beyond our own area. And, you know, I, for years I, I talked about the uh, uttermost parts. I'd, I'd preached about the uttermost parts. I'd heard about the uttermost parts. But until SOM, I had never been really engaged or had a relationship in the, in the uttermost parts. And so I'm, I'm just so excited to share what, what an opportunity that is for us to engage there. Some translations say uttermost parts. Some say remotest part of the earth. But literally, you know what the word is there? The word is simply this. It's at last places. The last places the gospel is going to go before Jesus comes back. The word is literally E S C H A T O U, the root there, where we get the word eschatology from, which is the last, uh, study the last things, right? Eschatos simply means farther. Huh, interesting. So that's what we're talking about today is the last. God's passion for the last. Who's, <clears throat> let's just kind of pause for a second and kind of bring it to our own world. Who's the, be honest with yourself this morning, who's the last person you would want to share the love of Christ with? We all have kind of our first, but let's kind of flip the coin a second. Who's that last person that you'd want to really share Christ's love with or be maybe emboldened to do it? Or maybe it's your, your crazy um, cousin, Eddie. I, I've got crazy cousin, uh, Eddie. Um, we're, we're really trying to reach out to Eddie, and, and he is... Um, a little bit too crazy. But anyway, uh, or maybe it's your temperamental boss. You know, you're like, ah, you know, I don't know about him. If I could really share the love of Christ with him. Or maybe you got some la- rowdy, kind of loud neighbors, like you're the, the last people. Be honest with it. Um, but I want you to put that person in mind here locally also when we're going through this talk about the last things, because God loves the last, not just there, but he loves the last one that you would share here. And he wants to maybe use you to shake it up with that person even this week. Um, God wants us to, to reach the last our Heavenly Father is the kind of Father who wants to stretch us, to expand our capacity to love, to help us. His love has gone to great lengths. So He'll test us sometimes that way and say, hey, do, you really, do you really love me? And let's share that, up, share that, right? I remember my first uh, trip to India in 2014, and I really got to experience my first case of true culture shock uh, going to India. They don't build those planes on the way to Asia. Um, they don't build those planes on the way to Asia for uh, big guys uh, like Charles and I, right? They, they, it's, it's not, Charles has been to th- Thailand, um, a part of the world he knows. You're, you're cramped in this little tight thing here, and you got a friend here, you got a friend right here, and you're like, oh, this is going to be a great flight. Oh, I love it, right? You know, and so I remember my first trip over, and you're so revved up. You're excited to go, you know. You can't sleep. So literally, the first, um, it's about a day and a half, you know, by the time you get over there, you're uh, going, <clears throat> you're, uh, I didn't sleep at all the whole time. And my stomach, after 15 hours dri- driving in, in a plane, if you will, traveling in a plane, you're, my stomach just starts, it's getting nauseous, you know. I'm like, oh, this is going to be just an experience, right? I mean, think about what, think about if you just drove for 15 hours and didn't stop what that would do to your stomach, right? So then tack on another 15 on top of that. So your stomach's just doing gymnastics on this thing, all right? You know, um, it's amazing. Uh, we, we, got to, uh, we got out to the India in the city, and I, I got my first real case of what they call chicken biryani, if you had not heard of that. It's one of the spiciest things. The part of India we went to is one of the spicier eating places, and, and I ate this, uh, um, this food just kind of half, uh, half groggy, and it's like burning a hole in my liver, going, oh my gosh. <laughs> um, I didn't know you could burn a hole in your liver, but you eat this biryani, you have a hole in your liver, and you're like, oh goodness, you know, what am I going to do? And and then I, I crashed about 4.30 on a Sunday afternoon, woke up, and I'll give me some coffee, right? Well, coffee in India is not the same as coffee here. It's thick, it's black, and, and, uh, and, and I'm like, oh my gosh, and uh, well, praise God, you finally get to sleep. When you do finally get to sleep after a trip, you really sleep good, and why, why is that worthwhile? Uh, it's because we finally got to be rewarded with this great joy, and there's such a great joy working with the people over there, because you get to see planters and leaders that go into literally parts of uh, of their country, I've got leaders gathering from all over the country and going to places that have never heard the name of Jesus and so remote, so difficult. And, and some of them, some of even the Indians don't know where they are. Holy Spirit leads them out. And they're like, okay, Lord, where am I going? But they're able to go and you get to touch them, encourage them and see uh, fruit from that. Um, 
The highlight is that engagement of Christian workers and Christian planters. And, uh, it's, it's amazing to see what God does. And, and, and to hear God's heart uh, about God reaching out to a world where the gospel has been so, um, uh, so difficult to get to. For, for, for so many in so many places, um, the gospel has been a long, long, long time coming. But guess what? Now that it's here, God's just going boom. We're, we're sending it out. We're sending workers out. We're taking the gospel. We're moving forward in the Lord. So we know then from Acts 1-8 that God has given us the power by His Spirit, that call to go and commission us out to these places, these far places in our, in our, uh, away from us to engage them, encourage them, to share uh, Christ with them. We also know that He's given us the promise to bring uh, salvation to the last places on the earth. Um, Paul and Barnabas, when they're heading out on that first missionary journey. Uh, we really see a biblical pattern in Acts 13 and 14, right beyond of going and, and taking the gospel and not only sharing with people, but shaking up community and shaking up the status quo. And he goes into uh, Pisidian Antioch there in Acts 13, and our, our passage begins in verse 46. It says, Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, since you repudiate it and, and, and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles, for so the Lord has commanded us. I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation, salvation to the ends of the earth. Again, God's heart, not just here with the gospel, not just here, but no, the ends, the farthest points away, right? Paul and Barnum, what was their, what was their MO? It was usually to go in, find the synagogue, find those people that are kind of leaning into God, share the Lord, and if they weren't willing, then they would go to the, to the Gentiles. Uh, and that's what the passage here out of Isaiah 49, 6, Paul's quoting. I placed you, you family, uh, each of you as a light. You are a light to that faraway person. If, if you're not going to reach that faraway person, who is, right? It's our opportunity. You're a light to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Again, there's that word, last places. Um, in this biblical pattern that Paul established in planting churches in Acts 13 and 14. I'm, I'm amazed. Let's just call it for a minute the life of it. What's the life of a church planter like? What does it mean to, to live? If you could be um, Charles for a day and put yourself in his shoes for just a second, what would that mean for you, right? There's, it's interesting, the parallels, even from the book of Acts, even in this church and even in India, how they correlate together. Um, when Paul's on the way out, right, Barnabas, he's going to the great un unknown. For them, it was the last place, the ends of the Roman world they were going to. And uh, he found that the, the church uh, must cultivate and break new ground. That's really the, the call of a, of a planter, a, a pioneer for Christ, if you will, a, an entrepreneur for Jesus to go and break new ground, right, to essentially have a message. And this is the message for the planter, for community. The status quo is dead. God is bringing a new order in. That's what he's going to do, right? The sedentary religious life is dead, and people need Christ for salvation, for hope. And it's the Holy Spirit that matures us and helps us to grow. Um, I met a pound planter one time, and he says, I, I, I just thought I was humble until I became a church planter. You know, right? You, know I mean? <laughs> you, you just think you have, because you've got this dream and this aspiration, but then you get out, get out there and helping people get from Christ apart from their life to Christ in their life, and maturing in Christ is a, is a journey, right? It's, it's a journey. Jesus brings a, this uh, uh, power through, through the planter. The biblical pattern in church planting means that planters take great risks. For a church planter coming out, for everybody kind of walking in here, you know, it's an uh, experience. You go home, have a nice cup of coffee, take a nap, and call it a day. For a church planter setting up, for a church planter moving to a new area, there's a lot of risk involved. We talk a lot at SOM about the risk. You take risk, right? You're risking as a leader, a planter. You're, you're risking your, um, your family. You're risking your finances. You're risking your reputation. You're risking, in some cases, your health. Uh, essentially, you're putting all your chips on the table and saying, I'm sacrificing myself to ride here and see if this works. That's what you're doing. And it's a kind of a, a fun group to be part of because when you meet other planters and they've experienced that, we're like, we're in this together. We're all... We're all in this together. The, you're gonna get, <laughs> if you're going to go deep sea fishing, right, you can't hug the coastline, right? You've got to get out there where the fish are. You've got to get out there and go deep. You've got to get out there with your equipment and your power and your radar, and you've got to throw yourself out. But guess what? The deeper waters are a little rougher, uh, a little bluer maybe, but a little, a little rougher, a little more difficult. But there in the deep water, family, oh, man, oh, man, there. The deep water. Whoa. 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 
you're bringing in and you're like, as a planner, you're just, you're going, wow. I just was thinking, man, we go out for a few fish here, but then you get the big fish and the bigger fish and, and God's powerful movement comes upon you and the whole boat's breaking up revival because you're like, wow, we're going deep sea fishing and we're bringing home some fish and a catch. Jesus says what? Yeah, you're my fisher's a man, right? You're a fisher. Fishermen, fishermen, we're all fishing for the Lord, fishing for people. Christ's heart, right? An Indian church planter will face frequent threats, right? Um, also, not everybody, not everybody wants to embrace you when you're going out there. I've knocked on enough doors over the years where they'll say, you know, I'll knock on a, one house I was walking up to, and, and I didn't get halfway down the garage, um, you know, the halfway down the driveway, and somebody yells out the window, go away, you know, okay. I met one dude in Tucson. We were planting down there, and this guy says, you know, I made a deal with God a long time ago. I, God, if you'll stay out of my church, if you'll stay out of my bars, I'll stay out of your churches. Wow. Wow. All right, we'll put you down for not interested. But what? I didn't really make a deal with God, but he was just trying to push back. You're going to get pushed back when you're planting a church, and any a church planter will face fr- frequent similar threats. There's a dominant Hindu leadership there that believes that church planters are essentially contaminating the villages. You are a cancer for the dominant Hindu militant group that's in control of many parts of India. Uh, In some places, the planters will come into and the the old guard establishment will say, if you you keep doing what you're doing, we're going to cut you up like a chicken. Now, that'll brighten your day. You put that on a Hallmark card, right? That's a Really wonderful day in ministry. We love it when we get encouragement as pastors. We love you. We don't like it when people say, you know what? We want to cut you up like a piece of chicken. Thank you very much for that just little Hallmark card encouragement there. But that's the reality they face. And they'll talk to their leaders, the supervisors, and they'll say, hey, what do we do here? You know, and they'll, they'll, they'll literally our, our leadership there will have to tell them, did God call you there to that village? About 1,100 people that don't know Christ. And they'll say, well, yeah. Well, then hang in there. And, um, you know, if you... If you if you do go and die, we'll take care of your family and we'll, we'll bury you well, you know. The guy that they told that really hung in there and he's still serving the Lord today, praise God. But it's common for planners to have those kind of experiences. It's also common for planners to be misunderstood. It's a common thing when you're planning a church. People don't, who is this guy? What's he want to do here? What's this church thing about? Why is he rocking up my status quo kind of world when I'm pretty comfortable the way things are? Paul goes out to teach, right? One minute he's teaching, he's sharing, next minute there's a riot that breaks out, you know. Um, you'll go back into a community years after you've been there into a church you've all planned and somebody will say, hey, are you, are you new here? I don't know who you are. Oh, oh yeah, I've been, I've been around, you know. It's just this disconnect, because huh? you're, you're, you're planting, you're, you're an entrepreneur for the Lord and you're, you're, you're casting out. It's common for a church planner to experience jealousy and bad feelings uh, from other religious leaders. Um, even Christians, we planted up in Cottonwood for uh, a number of years, and uh, even the churches there were really not hard. I heard one day from another pastor, the old guard's really not happy to have you here. You know that, right? You're, you're kind of an outsider. And even after you've been in the area for a while, you're still the new guy. So, but guess what? Praise the Lord, there's huge wins. Planting, it's worth it. It's worth the sacrifice. It's worth it by the mile. It's worth, it's worth setting up and tearing down church. It's worth uh, falling down. Uh, first time, for, it's worth something falling on your falling down on your ankle when you're trying to set up church and you get hurt sometimes we had a, a set up screen that was real big and every time we put it together it seemed like put it back together it kind of took out a little blood sacrifice but it was worth it right because you see people come to christ and you see people grow in christ and households are transformed and you see uh, people devoted to christ and maturing in christ and they're, they're getting over themselves going you know there is a god and he does love me and he wants to use me and he's chosen me to be a vessel we don't just plant churches, plant churches. It's a multiplication. The Lord wants to multiply himself, right? We're multiplying Christ and others. Christ's leadership, Christ's compassion, uh, Christ's care, Christ's vision. Christ, look, Jesus looked out on the masses, and what did he say? He said, Gosh, he looked out, and the word says he was like, had compassion. Like, as he saw, they were like a sheep without a shepherd. Who do you know that's in your life that's just shepherdless? I know, they're just drifting, right? Hmm. Guess what? God put you to that last person to be that shepherd, to be that voice, to be the anchor into Christ. Why church planting uh, in India is so, is so a blessing and joy is it's just a fruitful ministry. Leaders are changed and families are changed. Communities are changed and regions are changed. This is what it looks like. 
years back, there would be an area of villages where they'd be like, okay, here's 100 villages, and there's 100 villages, and there's not one gospel witness, not one church in these 100 villages in this region, okay? I, I, we're careful with security. We can't mention names of places, but generally speaking, you'll have an area that's got 100 villages without any... Well, pretty soon a planter will get out there, kind of a lonely planter, kind of on this long, empty road, right, walking out to the village, and people will come to Christ. They'll find a person of peace. Uh, believers will come. People will follow, get a house church going, and then another house church, and then there'll be five, and there'll be ten, and pretty soon there'll be ten house churches in, this, in these hundred villages, and then twenty, and then thirty, thirty-five. That's fruit, right, right there, seeing areas transformed uh, for the love of Christ. God has given us the, the power to go to the last places. He's given us really a, a, a promise for the last places, for salvation to the ends of the earth. And, and last, I want to share this. He has a plan uh, to reward his last uh, disciples. Many of you are familiar with the parable in, in Matthew chapter 20. I, I won't read the whole thing, but I'll just paraphrase a little bit for you. Um, Jesus' parable about going to the, the last workers. The master, you remember from the story, had a vineyard. A lot of work going on, a lot of opportunity going on, and he needed day labor. Back in the day, of course, agrarian culture, you'd go out and find workers to work in the vineyard field. So the workers are doing what workers in vineyards do, and they were paid a, a day rate of a denarius, which was a standard silver coin back in the Roman times, worth about 10 copper coins. So denarius meaning 10, right? That's kind of what you got paid for a day labor. And so the master's thinking, okay, who are, where can I find good workers? Where can I deploy, deploy them? And and how can I pay them at the end of the day? Now, this is kind of perks up our interest a little bit. We're talking about getting paid someday. Now, there is ultimately one of the best beauties of planting is there is an eternal payday, uh, which we're referencing here. The, 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 um, sometimes here's not so good, but up there, wonderful pay uh, when we get to heaven someday. But anyway, the master had a vineyard, and so we went out early in the day. You remember looking for workers. It was dawn, so it was like 9 in the morning, 6, 9 in the morning, right? He's looking for workers. Get some workers. They come on. Then back at 12, then back at 3 o'clock, he comes to get he comes to get workers. They're working, they're sweating, they're hard. They're looking forward to paying day. End of the day, 11th hour, it's like 5 o'clock. Because I want to go back and see if there's any more workers. Um, the great picture of the harvest fields of the Lord. There's always more work to do and always endless opportunities. And he finds some guys and some workers, if you will. Um, others as well saying, hey, they're ready. And he says, Master says, why aren't you guys working yet? Well, nobody's hired us yet. So come on, jump in the back of the truck paraphrase and let's get back to the vineyard field and I'm putting you guys to work so they worked how long did they work during that day one hour and then guess what 6 p.m. comes it's time to call it a day payday pay time in that culture you got paid at the end of the day Jesus does a couple very interesting things to shake it up here first thing he does to shake it up is he decides he's going to pay the last workers of the day first now wait a second Jesus hold on a second you know those guys that worked all day? They've been sweating all day. They've been working hard for you. Don't you think you ought to pay them first? Well, Jesus is like, let's pay the other ones first. So he kind of shakes it up there. If he'd, if he'd, <laughs> if he'd paid the, the ones first there first, well, then there wouldn't have been an issue. But he pays the last first. What is, but, and then he shakes it up even more. What does he give them? Do you remember from the story how much he pays them? He pays them the exact same wage as the ones that were there sweating in the heat of the day. Oh, wow. Wait a second, Jesus. That ain't fair. We've been here all day sweating, working, doing our thing. And look at you, Jesus. Paying these, these, these last workers, the same thing we're getting. You know, you can see kind of what's going on there. And honestly, in some ways, you can't blame them, right? They're, hey, they're, they're doing. But what does Jesus say? Right? Wait a second. Hold on a second. This is a, it's a picture of God's grace. Right? God loves the last disciples, right? He, he rewards them. Jesus is... is, is is putting us on notice. Don't be shocked if I shake it up on the rewards day and pay these last disciples and these last disciple makers as much or maybe even more than you guys that have been there for a while. You know why? Because guess what? You were saved by grace and so now you'll be rewarded by grace. Wow. It's an interesting picture, isn't it? An exciting picture of God's outpouring and God's message and God's really grace for the last peoples. And this is also a picture of God's heart to the Jews and the Gentiles. Who were the early workers in the day? Who were the workers that knew God and followed God? It was the Jews, the Hebrews who walked with God and chosen people and been together with God. And who were, the, who were the last workers to come? We, us Gentiles, like these here in India. 
Now, even now, God is pouring himself out on the most persecuted, the most ostracized, the most broken, uh, the most far away. To be a comic Christian in India is tough because everybody in your family, everybody in your village, everybody at work, everybody in your region send you. When you come to Christ in India, you lose your family, disown you. Part of the Muslim world that Caleb has been, they, they literally will have a mock funeral for you. Dad will say, they're no longer my kid. They're out. So you lose your family. Your job, your employment's not looking so good. Your career just took a nosedive. Because you've chosen Christianity, and Christian, Christians are marginalized, right? You lose your family, you lose your village, um, your job, and your village says a lot of times, goodbye, we don't want you in our village anymore. You know what? But they stay faithful, and they hang in there, and they persevere, and they, uh, they find favor like Joseph did, working with their boss, and they find favor with their family later on, working their way back in, and people see that Christ has changed their life, and there's more joy and more peace and more hope in their life than, than anybody else in the village has ever seen before. And everybody's like, you know what, this Jesus guy, I want in. I want in. Because he's, this disciple has got something going on that, I, that I've just got to have. And I don't care if I lose the support of a billion other people in my country. I want to follow Christ and count the cost. I want to take the risk. I want to follow. That's the message. One of my favorite stories is kind of wrapping things up here in a minute here uh, about India. is a great, great story. It's a, it's a story of a guy named Janesh. Janesh was um, one of the persecutors like a Paul story, a militant supporter of Hinduism, a member of what they call the RSS, uh, a group that attacks Christians. Um, again, there's this militant threat over Christians that basically want to subdue and hurt Christians. And oh, by the way, the ones I mentioned about losing their job and their home, those are the ones that got it good. They were not the ones that were hurt because there's an assault and people can die out there. But this Janesh was a warrior for Hinduism, basically. Uh, when he came into a, a coffee house where they, th- they served coffee to Christians, he would throw hot water in their faces. Uh, he would go into villages, and what they would do is they would put the Christians in a circle, or put the villagers in a circle, excuse me, and the ones that were Christians, they would beat with sticks. That was essentially their, their, uh, their job description. Find the Christians and beat them with sticks. Um, that's what they did. Worse yet, though, a Christian missionary came into the region one day, and Janesh and two other RSS thugs assaulted the missionary and killed him. Uh, one of them, apart from Janesh, took a machete and cut the missionary up into peace. And Janesh participated in the murder. The next few days, uh, this, this militant Hindu who'd killed the Christian missionary started to feel remorse, um, guilt, pain and, and agony and distress from what he had done and what he had done to that, that, that missionary. And uh, he started to struggle and search and learn. And one day, about a week later, he met a Christian missionary who told him, yeah, that's wrong and you really messed up, but there is, there is a God who loves you. There is a Savior who died for you. And by the blood of Christ, you can be forgiven, restored. And so Janesh accepted Christ and became a Christ follower. He actually went into church planting school, and I got to meet him when I was out there a few years ago. He was the sweetest man with a sweet spirit. You'd never know this guy was a, had it in him to be such a thug so many years ago, but he literally sang us a sweet little song. I've got his testimonies back on the booth back there just to tell a little more about his story, but amazing thing, God's grace. God's grace. Hear this. God loves the last places. God loves the last people. God's pouring out in this day, in this time, these last days we live, an outpouring of a spirit, his presence, to know God, to follow God, and to get on board before it's too late. Why get involved in the global church, specifically India? We learn more about God's heart for the nations. We get to learn new cultures, new peoples. Uh, we, we can work um, together to, to be fruitful global um, disciple makers. Nowadays, with the, with the technology where, where it is, you can get on board a, a video call and make disciples in, in, in many places in the world. Um, it's incredible. And why now? Why now? Because God is pouring out his spirit on Southeast Asia now, on India now. We have strong leaders in the field. Um, our key leadership in these places that were on the video have been there 10 years. There's established relationships. There's a, they're established fruit bearers. And, and you're going to get so blessed by working with them and hearing their reports. And, and, and finally this, India is centrally located. God is very strategic, right? Here's Israel in the heart of the Fertile Crescent, the ancient world. His people could be light to the whole region. In the same way, India, God is pouring out on India because of this. He wants to use India to reach Pakistan and Nepal and Bhutan and uh, Miramar. That whole area springs off from God's amazing work uh, in India. 
So thanks for letting me share today. Um, how do we get involved? Just a few things real quick. To, we can, certainly prayers, it's a prayer-based ministry. We can't go in these areas at risk. We can't go down new doors unless there's prayer and a prayer covering. And prayer is a huge part of what we're doing. Serving, being an advocate for global work. You know, you get a book, you give a book to a friend. You, we're just really wanting to connect with people and, and put people on our, uh, sign up people for a newsletter. But you can be an advocate for saying, hey, there's this crazy guy that came and spoke at church today. I've never met so many crazy. You gotta be crazy to go to India. Why is this crazy guy talking to church? And Charles is crazy for bringing him. But it's a good crazy family because it changes you by working with people that need the crazy love of Jesus. He's a funny God. A crazy God, isn't he? That he would go oh, love the most ostracized, disenfranchised, broken in the world. That's Jesus Christ. And maybe you're sitting here today going, I don't know this Jesus, and I don't know this church, and I don't know this David, I don't know this Charles, but I want to say to you, Jesus loves you. If he's willing to go to the ends of the earth to show his love and has a vision for every tribe and every nation, he has a vision for you in your life, and he has a plan for you and a purpose for you. I wouldn't have imagined years ago that God could draft me to a service like this, but he's chosen us. So finally, finally this, um, please sign up for our newsletter. Um, we just want to build a relationship. We want to send you updates, and it's a news organization. Find out what's going on in other parts of the world. And if you sign up for our newsletter, um, you get a free book. and get to, We also do a lot of publishing for that. So Holy Spirit wants to use you, and you're going to be blessed. Um, the Lord has chosen India as a planting dreamland where spiritual awakening is rising and where God is empowering and abo- uh, 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 strengthening abounding new church planters every day. Let's pray. Oh. Lord, we want to pause and just remember our brothers and sisters in India and in Pakistan and China and Syria in Senegal, in Nigeria, where they're getting killed every week for you, Lord. Every week, Christians are dying in Nigeria. And yet, bold witnesses are standing up and standing fast, saying, we're gonna, we're gonna hang on to Jesus at all costs. And Lord, we're inspired by that today. We wanna, we wanna be a part of that more and more today, of your love and your grace and your encouragement in our lives. And so I pray, Holy Spirit, you would just quicken our spirit to your love and your willingness to, or willingness to just engage. Whatever part of that world it is, Holy Spirit, you're the one that leads. We don't control. You're the one that leads to the continents and the countries and the people. But you lead out. You go. You share. Lord, I want to pray for those here today that are thinking about that last person they would share the love of Christ with. My cousin Eddie, a temperamental boss, a rowdy neighbor, an unfriendly coworker. Holy Spirit, we can't do that in our own strength. We don't have the wisdom, but you and your power and your grace and your love are bold in and through us and can be so every day for the glory of God. The boldness to share your word, the boldness to live your word out, and the boldness to go home to you someday and know, Lord, that you were honored and pleased in this life we had here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks, Dave, very much. Yeah, give him a round of applause. Now, some of you may be going, hey, well, why bring a guy like this in to share today? And there's a couple of things. Number one, I, I wanted you to hear some of the things that Caleb and I are hearing, um, because we know that God is impressing on us that we should be an Acts 1-8 church. Um, and by Acts 1-8, I mean, listen, we should be loving inside of our community. We should be loving in our state and our country, and we should be loving into the last places. We don't have a last place where we're loving at yet. Just to be honest with you. And we're praying about what does that look like for us as a church. And I just wanted to let you hear from Dave as, and invite you to be praying with us about what does that mean for the church at Australia to be praying for and thinking about how we love in the last places. Now, I'm going to encourage you at the, at the end, go back. He's got a booth that's back there. Do sign up so you can stay in, in touch with stuff. The book that he's got is a great resource that's there, and he'll just give it to you if you just sign your name and give him an email. It's great. It's a great deal, right? And then you can click unsubscribe. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I, I do want to encourage you to, to go back and to join us as we continue to pray about the last places. I'm going to also remind you next week, come back. 
because we are going to continue our idea about loving, and he already talked about that last person that's on your list, and we're going to talk about what Jesus says about that next week when we come back and talk about our series at the movies and loving your enemies. It's going to be great. You don't want to miss it. Um, the lobby will be set up and decked out for our at the movie stuff. Bring a friend, invite a neighbor. This is a fun time to come. The room will smell like popcorn. Um, we might even give some of the popcorn away for you to eat while we're in here. Um, it's going to be a great time. So come back and be a part of that day. Here's what I want to do. I want you to stand up. We're going to sing Run to the Father uh, on our way out today. Hey, I pray that you guys have a blessed, blessed week. And just remember next week, um, for At The Movies, we won't be live streaming. Um, those will be going up during the course of the week because of uh, copyright issues and how the bots work on YouTube and stuff.
thank you all for coming today. We love you and the Lord loves you.